So this update is probably going to be both more and less than uh, you'd hoped for. Um, this is the SHAMP project. It stands for the Seattle Heterosexual HIV AIDS Modeling for Prevention Project. Uh, is SHAMP is sort of uh, an outgrowth of WAMP, which is what Darcy's dissertation has turned into. That was the Washington HIV Modeling for Prevention. And all of that is an outgrowth of CAMP, uh, which is the Coalition for Applied Modeling and Prevention, uh, which is a joint uh, uh, effort um, by the University of Washington and Emory University in conjunction with CDC funding uh, to develop tools for modeling uh, the spread of HIV in populations, but trying to do it at, in a way that is informed by local data so that it actually can be used by local public health uh, departments uh, to do some planning and prevention uh, activities. So I'm going to tell you a little bit today about SHAMP in particular, the project overview, some of the history, motivation, and structure. Uh, and then I'm going to spend most of the talk talking about the model structure and the data inputs. And that's kind of where we are right now. We have a, a NIH R21, and we're about six months from the end of that. Uh, and the last six months, I think, are going to be frenetic, if, I, if this is any indication, because we've spent a long time on model structure and data inputs. And so there are three basic components to the modeling here uh, that require inputs. The local demographics uh, and then the structure of the transmission system. The transmission system itself has many different components. There's the dynamic partnership network. Once you've got that network, there's within partnerships the kinds of behaviors that occur. Then, of course, a network has some boundaries, uh, even though populations don't necessarily have those boundaries or the boundaries are porous. So you've got some boundary exposure that you've got to deal with. Um, and then there's infectivity and the force of infection once all of that is uh, uh, addressed. So all of that uh, forms the transmission system, and I'll be speaking primarily about that today. Um, then you also have the care continuum and clinical outcomes, and obviously here is where we have a lot of the levers for uh, prevention and planning that we might want to see what happens if we uh, have an impact uh, in, in an area there. What, how does that change the transmission dynamics of the whole system? And I'll talk briefly about validation and calibration of these models, uh, what the empirical validation targets are, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, something that kind of emerged over the course of this project, which wasn't part of its original plan, uh, which was calibrating the model against phylogenetics. All right, so in terms of overview, um, as I said, this is really, the, the goal here is there are lots of different modeling techniques, frameworks out there. Lots of people have their favorites. Um, I think what our group is really focused on is trying to develop tools that can really be locally grounded. So you don't have a Franken model where some of the data comes from one country, some other data comes from another country. Maybe you make some of the data up. You probably still are always going to have to make some of the data up. But um, the point here is to try to locally ground the model because HIV policy and planning is often done at a local or state level, and that's where the resource allocation issues become uh, particularly important. We're also focusing on the heterosexual epidemic in Seattle King County, and I think if Matt had been on the committee for funding, we probably wouldn't have gotten funded <laughs> because why the heck are you interested in heterosexuals here in King County, right? They are a very small fraction of lo local HIV prevalence and incidence. I believe on the order of, on the incidence side, about 10% of incidence, is that what we But something more like 20% of prevalence, roughly speaking? I think something around that, okay. So, so if this is a small part of the epidemic, why is it a priority for us? Well, there are very large racial disparities, of course, as there are in all aspects of the epidemic. These are important to address. New diagnoses are declining, as they are in all groups as well. But I think in this particular group, among heterosexuals, because we're really pretty boring as a bunch, um, we're actually probably on the threshold of eradication for heterosexuals, much, much closer to that threshold, I think, than we may be for MSM. But stay tuned for Darcy's uh, 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 dissertation project, because that's exactly what she's looking at uh, in her project. So our goal here is to determine whether targeted prevention could actually lead to eradication among heterosexuals. And the NIH uh, 
funded project that we have for that is it's like a it's a pilot project it's really a feasibility project to see what we've got in terms of data how well that maps to the model structure that we need uh, and whether we can actually use a tool like this um, uh, for real prevention planning purposes so the structure of the project in terms of personnel, there are a group of modelers um, at the University of Washington coming out of what we call the Network Modeling Group. That's uh, me, Devin Hamilton is here today. He did some of the last minute things that I'll be showing you. Uh, Jeanette Birnbaum, who's not uh, able to come today, um, but she's played a really important role in this. The goal here was we have some, some of these modeling tools have already been developed for policy guidance for MSM prevention, and this is part of the CAMP project. So Emory, CDC, University of Washington Modeling Group are all working on MSM-related prevention. Uh, that's a five-year project, and a lot of those tools are, as a result, in place. But doing uh, the same kind of really locally grounded heterosexual modeling requires uh, some pretty serious uh, modifications of the modeling and obviously of the data that come in. Uh, and we're turning in part to the epidemiologists to, uh, to inform us about these data. Um, these are people typically who are on the boundary of the University of Washington and Public Health Seattle King County. So Sarah, who I think is not here today, is that right? She yeah, she couldn't. Okay. So Sarah Glick and Roxanne, who is here, are uh, the two people who are sort of on that boundary. Um, both of these folks work on behavioral epi surveillance data collection. Um, Sarah Glick is the PI for the NHBS, the local NHBS project, or national, what is that? The Thank you. Um, <clears throat> And Roxanne Karani has done some rather remarkable work looking at immigration dynamics and has managed to um, shoehorn a little bit of a question, uh, a set of questions into the standard surveillance protocol here uh, in Public Health Seattle King County. So we have data on immigration dynamics here that are really unique. Then there's an advisory board that's made up uh, of people both in public health and uh, at the university um, at Public Health Seattle King County. These are the folks who are getting us the data. They're sort of responding to our repeated data requests. Amy Bennett, Susan Buskin, who's here. Amy's not here, right? Right, okay. And Caitlin, is, Caitlin is also not here. Uh, Caitlin's moved to TV and Amy has sick kids. Okay. <laughs> Don't we all have sick kids, right? Uh, if we're not sick ourselves. From the Washington State Department of Health, Jason Carr has been uh, helping us get access to MMP and some other data sets. And the University of Washington, Matt, and uh, Matt, who's here, and David Katz, who is not. So, the original plan was to develop this model structure to reflect the lo local heterosexual epidemic dynamics. I still remember um, it was a full day workshop that we had on racial disparities in HIV here in Seattle. And I think it was something like 2003. It was a long time ago. And somebody got up, and I can't remember who it was, from the Washington State Department of Health and pointed out that the, among the racial disparities, although the racial disparities in HIV in Washington on the surface look just like everywhere else, if you dig down a little bit, it turns out almost half of uh, the, the African-American cases uh, are actually foreign-born. And so all of a sudden that puts a whole new sort of sense of what the dynamics are in terms of the heterosexual epidemic here, or it did for me. So that meant um, one of the key things we wanted to look at was the contribution of immigration and travel, travel to the specific racial disparity profile here in Seattle King County. Um, but we're also interested in the contribution of boundary exposure uh, that is the boundary exposure for heterosexuals to the local MSM epidemic. Uh, and that comes from the kind of, uh, well, a couple of things. There's a paper by uh, Alex Oster at CDC that analyzed the, um, the Paul sequences, phylogenetics basically, across the U.S. and found that I think it was, what, 25 percent of heterosexual females actually, 36? 36. 36% 36 of heterosexual females actually clustered more closely with an MSM sequence than they did with a heterosexual male sequence. And if you then drill down to look at uh, sort of regional differences in those percentages, it was over 50% for uh, heterosexual women in, in the Western region. Um, so there's clear evidence that there's boundary exposure there. And so the question is, can we find a way to accurately represent that in the model? <clears throat> 
The second thing we wanted to do was identify local data sources for all the model components. Of course, this is going to turn out to be the big challenge, and you'll see some of that uh, in today's talk. For demography, it's not that hard to get uh, demographic uh, 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 profiles uh, for King County. Um, but for the transmission system, it turns out it's, we don't have a lot of the local data that we would need. Um, we go back to local data when we get to the care cascade and clinical outcomes. Obviously, we collect very good information on that. But that's a lot easier to collect. Keep, keep in mind, the, the transmission system that we're going to be representing here is a, is a population. It's not just the people who show up at the clinic. It's not just the people who show up who are HIV positive. We're really trying to represent the population dynamics. And for that, you actually have to have data on everybody in the population, not just the people who show up in a care system. So where data are unavailable, the third thing that we were tasked with doing then was to discuss possibilities for local collection. And I think um, some of what I'm going to show you today will give you a sense of what it would mean if we wanted to do local data collection here, what kinds of data we would actually have to collect. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn to model structure and data inputs and give you a sense of what the different pieces of uh, this modeling uh, tool look like. So we start with, yes, there we go. We start with a dynamic network. And there are going to be three different types of uh, people in this by sex and sexual preference. In the local heterosexual network, we have men who have sex with men and women, men who have sex with women only and women. Uh, and the sexual partnerships that we're representing here do not include injection drug use, right? So that's the heart of the system. Within discordant partnerships, then, in a system like that, you have behavior, which involves both coital frequency and condom use. And you have, then, infectivity uh, within discordant partnerships that depends on behavior, but also depends on the stage of infection of the infected individuals, um, the engagement in care for both infected and uninfected individuals, so PrEP and ART, and then the clinical outcomes of any kind of biomedical prevention or treatment um, that's occurring. But then you also have boundary exposure. So, you know, all, all models here, I guess I'm tethered at this point, all models have some kind of a boundary, and the question is how do you manage the exposure across the boundary? And basically what we're doing is we're identifying foreign-born individuals in our population and understanding what kind of exposure they might have from foreign countries as a result of travel back to that country. Um, anything, any part of their uh, HIV prevalence differential that is due to having arrived with HIV already is already incorporated in HIV prevalence differentials that are already reflected in the model. So the part that we're trying to get dynamically is as these people travel back and forth to their home country, is it possible, uh, what, what does their exposure look like? And we rely on uh, Roxanne's data to get us uh, some of that information. The other boundary that we've got is men who have sex with both uh, males and females. This is the boundary to the local MSM epidemic. Uh, and so we want to identify the sort of the force of infection across that boundary as well. Okay, so the demographics for boundary exposure then sort of set up what we need to, how we need to structure our population with respect to demographics. Um, so exposure to the MSM epidemic requires identification of men who have sex with both males and females. And that means that we have this kind of sex by sex preference grouping of females, males who have sex with females, and males who have sex with both males and females. Um, the exposure to epidemics in high prevalence countries requires identification of Im immigrants who may either arrive HIV positive or return to those countries. So our race immigration grouping here is uh, uh, U.S. born blacks, black immigrants, U.S. born Hispanics, Hispanic immigrants, and then basically everybody else. Our demographic data come from the American Community Survey, the 2015 American Community Survey for King County. Um, so we pull in order, in order to understand the, sort of the population composition and the vital dynamics, that is the births, the entries into the population, and the deaths, uh, the mortality rates, um, we're relying on uh, the American Community Survey. For the travel uh, uh, data, we're relying on Roxanne's supplement. Um, notice that the 
the issue with Roxanne's supplement, it's great in some ways, it's probably more information than a lot of places have. Um, it's really only for HIV positives because we only get to see them if they show up HIV positive. So we don't know what this travel pattern looks like for the entire population. We only know what it looks like for HIV positives. For the dynamic partnership networks, um, this is actually modeled as three overlapping networks. So what we're using is a stochastic uh, network transmission model here. Uh, and, the, and the network model itself, the dynamic network itself, is modeled independently of the transmission process. So um, there are three overlapping networks. The first is cohabiting partnerships. People can have either zero or one cohabiting partner. Uh, these tend to last longer, of course. Uh, there are persistent partnerships, and persistent partnerships you can have two or more at a time. Um, uh, these tend to have shorter lengths, and of course I'll be showing you the durations of these things. And then there are one-time partners, and these we, there's a certain rate per year that people engage in these. These have no persistent duration. They last one time step, basically, in the model. And we model these with uh, exponential family random graph models. That's what an ergum is. At the dyad level, basically, so for any pair of persons in the simulation, the probability of a partnership given the other partnerships that exist for both of those partners at the moment is just, this is the, the log of that. So the log odds of this is a linear function. Um, so it's an exponential function in the raw data of uh, some network statistics here, which I'll be talking about, and these form the basis of all of the inputs in the model. And those network statistics will change if this partnership exists or not. So that's how it changes, the delta here. And then there's a theta here. So this is very much like a logistic regression model, except that there's some dependence in the data. Uh, and this is the coefficients that basically say for a particular network configuration, and I'll talk about what those are as we go on, is that more or less likely than you would expect by chance given the population composition. And that's what we're estimating here is uh, these thetas. But what we have to observe then are these network statistics. For the partnerships that have duration, and that's the cohabiting partnerships and the persistent partnerships, we're actually modeling that with what's called a stergum. That's a separable temporal ergum. That's to represent the length of the partnerships, right? So it's not just that a partnership exists and then it disappears. We actually have to represent the, both the formation and the dissolution process. So stergums have two equations. There's a formation equation, which models the probability of a partnership forming, and then a dissolution equation, which models the probability of it dissolving at each time step. When you estimate these models based on data, what you end up getting, and we have cross-sectional data, right? So we're, it's kind of interesting that we're able to represent or estimate these dynamic uh, uh, underlying processes from cross-sectional data. But what the estimated dynamic models will then do is they will reproduce your observed cross-sectional statistics, right? So that's how they're based in data. The one-time partnerships are just modeled with a simple ergum the cohab and persistent with this sort of two equation stergum. So what's in these network models? Well, that's basically, that's the stuff on the right hand side uh, that determines the log odds of a tie between two people. These are the network statistics. For the cohabiting and persistent partnership uh, formation network equations, we have terms representing nodal attributes like age categories, their sex and sex preference grouping, uh, the race and immigration categories. Uh, those are effectively, you can think of them as main effects in the model. These are the, the activity rate differentials, basically, uh, by age, sex preference, race, and immigration. We then have mixing, which uh, is about assortative mixing or disassortative mixing uh, by age, by sex and sexual preference, and again, by race and immigration. You can think of these as kind of interaction effects in the model. And then for each of the networks, keep in mind there are three different networks, so there are equations that are unique to each network. Um, for the cohab networks, we have whether or not you have a persistent partner at the same time. And for the persistent partner networks, we have whether you have a cohab partner at the same time. That's one of the things that predicts whether or not you're going to form one of these other relationships. 
Uh, and obviously for the cohab partnerships, um, you're constrained to a maximum of one. For the one-time partner formation network, we, have, we don't have a dissolution network, obviously. Uh, we have, again, node attributes, age categories, et cetera, whether or not there's a cohab partnership, uh, whether or not there's a persistent partnership. So both types of other partnerships play a role in the cohab network. Um, but because the one-time partners don't have any duration, they're not there to play a role in the, in the cohab and persistent partner formation. <coughs> You have a constraint here as well that in any one time step, you can have a maximum of one one-time partner. The dissolution networks, that's for both the cohab and the persistent partners, they have a partnership-specific constant hazard of dissolving. We could make that much more complicated, but at this point, uh, that's what we're doing. So how does it work that we estimate these things if we don't see the whole network? This is a little bit of... Um, kind of statistics that I'm trying to slide under the uh, carpet here without anybody noticing. Um, we have just what we call an egocentrically sampled network. We don't have the whole network. We don't have every node and every link. We just have some randomly chosen persons in this network and the partnerships that they've reported. We haven't even enrolled their partners. Um, this kind of ergum or stergum estimation requires observation of the sufficient statistics. So we haven't observed it for the whole population, but what we have done from an egocentric sample is we can observe what we call degree distributions. This is the number of currently active partnerships of each type that people have. Uh, we observe mixing by nodal attribute because we've asked respondents what race, what age, what immigration status their partners are and we have the duration of partnerships by type. So we actually do see a fair amount of information here. We simply have to scale it up to what it would look like uh, at the population level. So the adjustment, the scaling up, is uh, we do by what we call per capita scaling. That just basically means that we assume uh, the average number of partners that people have is more or less constant, even if the network grows. So as the network gets larger and larger and larger, and there are millions of people, you don't all of a sudden have millions of partners. You probably still have a typical number of partners per year, right? So that's the kind of uh, adjustment that we do. That's one of the few assumptions that's necessary in the model. OK, so most of the presentation now is actually going to focus on some of these network statistics. Um, and as I say, there are great things here, not so great, and some downright ugly stuff. So just to recap what we need. We've got these three different networks, cohabiting, persistent, one-time partners, and all of this needs to be broken down by age, sex, sexual preference, race, and immigration status. So that's a fair amount of information. It's a data-hungry model in that way. Not any hungrier than most, but um, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. And no, the answer is we don't have local data to do this. And I think we kind of knew this going in because we had done a fair amount of uh, rooting around to see what kind of data was available. The big issue that in terms of having local data available is we need population level data, not HIV positive or STD positive uh, data, or just high risk groups. And those are the two forms of data that we have locally. Um, so that's not really going to allow us to, um, to, to do, to, um, parameterize this model. So what we're doing instead is we're using two nationally representative surveys, uh, which we reweight to match uh, King County demographics. And it's kind of amazing that we actually have these data. I think we're, in fact, in sort of a better situation that way than many MSM studies, because uh, these are at least representative of the population. And the NSFG, I think, is particularly remarkable. That's the National Survey for Family Growth. It's an annual survey. It's conducted by the National Center for Health Statistics, so a branch of the CDC. It's collected egocentric sexual network data for heterosexuals since 2006, so that's a long time. We've got you know, like 10 years' worth of data there. Each year has about 5,000 respondents nationwide. So if you pool, if you assume, no, again, there's an assumption here, if you assume that not much has changed between 20, 2006 and 2016, there are over 40,000 respondents in this sample. So that's a nice large sample. And you'll see we still end up with problems in terms of small cell sizes. Uh, but it tells you something about how many respondents you would actually need. The other great thing about this, the data are all available online. They're really well documented. Um, uh, and the only issue is that the age range is 15 to 44. We're going to be 18 to 49. Um, or 59, right? 
18 to 59. So we end up grabbing some old people <laughs> from another survey, the National Health and Social Life Survey, um, for the 45 to 59 year olds. These data are also available online from ICPSR, much smaller sample size. I think we're talking about 3,000 for uh, NHSLS. So we're going to pool these two data sets together. And we use the data from this, appropriately weighted to represent King County uh, uh, demographics, for all of the network and behavior input. So that's a, that's a long list of things, and I'm going to be talking about at least most of these. I won't be talking about the coital frequency and condom use, because you'll see once we get to that point in the presentation, we're already so far down the line that I want to show you something else instead. All right, so let's see some data. Okay, so. Um, what we're looking at here is what we call the degree distribution. Well, I'm sorry, the momentary mean degree. So the number, the, the number of partners that people have on average for each of the three different networks, the cohabiting partner network, the persistent partner network, the one time. The one time is actually a rate per 100 people per year. So if we look at the cohabiting uh, network, what we're looking at here is broken down by age, the, the Essentially, because the cohabs are restricted to you can have either zero or one, we're looking at the proportion of people who have a cohabiting partner by age here. And you can see that proportion goes up pretty dramatically uh, so that you're up to a, a sort of maximum of about 80% by the time people are in the oldest age group. Corresponding to that, the persistent partnerships <coughs> decline with age. Um, they were never as high as the cohabiting partnerships, but there's a clear uh, sort of negative correlation between these two. And the one-time partnerships as a rate uh, per 100 persons per year also declines pretty dramatically by age. And in fact, keep in mind that whenever I show the 45 to 60-year-old group in the population, that's the NHSLS, and basically nobody in the NHSLS over 45 years old reported a one-time partner in the last year. Small numbers, mind you, but Nonetheless, we got zero. Zilch. All right, so what are these things that we're looking at? These things turn out to be the G of Y, basically, the, the term that we need, the sufficient statistics that we need for the age uh, category main effects in each of the network formation models. So each one of the things that I'm going to show you becomes a sufficient statistic that then informs the egocentric estimation. We can also look at how partnership types are broken down by race and immigration status. Um, so again, we're looking at either the mean degree or the rate, depending on if we're talking about the one-time partners or uh, either of the other two partnerships. So we've broken this down by black. These are US-born black, black immigrant, US-born Hispanic, Hispanic immigrant, and whites and others. Uh, you can see that there's some differences here, especially with respect to cohabiting partnerships, um, and most pronounced differences really for U.S.-born blacks who have a substantially lower fraction of cohabiting partners, uh, but a higher fraction of uh, persistent partners. One of the biggest differences between uh, cohabiting and persistent partnerships is the durations. Cohabiting durations average 10 to 15 years across the demographic groups. Um, so if you, if you look at it by uh, the race of the person reporting the partnership, you see almost no differences really in the length of cohabiting partners uh, for the different race groups. Um, uh, not much difference either in the persistent, a little bit different here. It turns out that persistent partnerships among blacks tend to last a little bit longer than uh, the other groups which is interesting because they tend to have more persistent partners than cohabiting partners, right? So all sorts of kind of unique effects going on here. Those will be reflected in the model because there will be group specific, uh, I think we're we doing race specific hazards of dissolution? Not yet. That's not yet, plan. that's the plan, okay. So not yet, but it will be there. When you look at the variation by age and the duration, of course, younger people haven't had a chance to have long cohabiting partnerships yet, so their cohabiting partnerships tend to be shorter. It's just something you gotta keep in mind. So I want to give you a sense of what it means to actually put all these overlapping partnership networks together. At any point in time, a person can have none or some of each partnership type. So what I've broken down here for females and for males is the number of persistent partners, and keep in mind they can have two or more persistent partners here, by the number of cohabiting partners. They can have either none or one. 
So you can see that for both groups, the majority of the sample is uh, people who have no persistent partners but have a cohabiting partner. Um, there is, I think, the next largest group, yeah, for both of them is those who don't have a cohabiting partner but have a persistent partner. And then as you start to get into uh, this category here, so this is one persistent partner and no cohabiting partners. This is a cohabiting and a persistent partner, so that's for females and for males. And this is having more than one persistent partner when you have no cohabiting partner or when you do have a cohabiting partner. So you can begin to see how the, what the distribution looks like for that overlap. But in addition, there are the one-time partnerships, right? So what those look like here, this is the rate of one-time partners per 100 persons for each of those groups for females. Uh, and you can see the highest rate is uh, having one-time partners when you don't have either of the other type of partners. So that makes a certain amount of sense. Um, but then you also, with a cohabiting partner, that's the next highest rate is um, the occasional one-time partner with a cohabiting partner. For men, these rates are much higher. Um, uh, so, uh, in fact, they're, they're sufficiently high that I actually want to go back and double check that we've, we've calculated this correctly. <laughs> Um, so, but it's, uh, uh, so keep in mind this is a rate. So this is not the percentage of these men. This is for the percent of men that do have uh, uh, no other partners. Every hundred of them will have 23 one-time partners over the course of a year. So every hundred of them, right? So you can see the same sort of pattern as we saw for the females, albeit much higher. Uh, so the highest rates are among those who have no partners. Um, but here, a persistent partner, there's a slight difference. The persistent partners are more likely to have a one-time partnership uh, concurrent to them. Um, uh, and the cohabiting partners also, but not quite as high. So what that does is it creates a number of different types of concurrency. Two forms. You have what's called within network. Um, you can't have within network for all of them. And the cohabiting, you can't have more than one cohabiting partner. So there's no concurrency between cohabs, but for persistent partners, you can uh, have more than one uh, persistent partner. So within network, you can have concurrency for persistent partners. Cross network, um, you can have a cohab and a persistent partner, a cohab and a one-time, or a persi persistent and a one-time. So there are a number of different types of concurrency that can happen. And all of these, of course, can vary by age, sex, race, and immigration status. So if we look at concurrency, and this is just for the heterosexual partners now. Keep in mind there is a, some additional concurrency that can happen when people have men who have sex with men and women have a male partner, but that's not within the network. That's a boundary exposure. So this is just within the network. Um, the highest rates of concurrency are among the men who have sex with both men and women, and this is just their heterosexual concurrency. So they have higher rates of overall concurrency, and about half of that is uh, cross-network concurrency here. So that's about 2% of the uh, men who have sex with both men and women. About 45% of these men, however, uh, also are likely to have a male partner during the year. So the concurrency rate for them is actually particularly high. The lowest overall rates, not surprisingly, are among women. We see that repeatedly. It doesn't mean that women are underreporting. It just means that um, uh, there are more partnered women than there are partnered men. There are more men with zero partners often. And as a result, the men who have one partner sometimes have more than one partner. So the, the, the partnership numbers balance out. But the concurrency is different. And then if you wanted to, to spend a long time looking at this, um, which I wouldn't recommend, I'll just say the concurrency, when you break it down by sex and age and race immigration, the highest rates are for young men. So you can see that here in the 18 to 25 year olds, and then it begins to decline for the 20, 25 to 35 year olds. But the highest rates that we're seeing, and now we're getting into you know, six and a half to seven and a half percent, basically, uh, concurrency. And this is any concurrency, this is, um, cross-network concurrency. So these are mostly concurrencies between persistent partners that are happening here. And this is for males, uh, for native-born uh, or US-born blacks. So the highest rates that we also see are for both black men and women. So the concurrency rates are higher both for black women and for black men than they are for any of the other groups, and highest for the youngest. So those are all patterns that are more or less what you would expect.
So that gives you a little bit of a sense. Those, those are kind of mean degree patterns. Those are the main effects that we talked about some. I'm going to turn now to uh, some of the interaction effects, the mixing effects. Um, mixing by age, as you might expect, um, is fairly strong, strongly assortative for all types of partnerships. What we're looking at here is within partnership type, the percent of total partnerships that are for an ego, that is the person who reported the partnership by alter age, so ego by alter age. And along the diagonal is where you see most of the partnerships. Um, for cohabiting partnerships, because most of these are among older people, you're actually seeing so most of the density is in the lower uh, di part of that diagonal. For both persistent and one-time partnerships, you still see very high assorted of mixing, but it's those partnerships tend to happen among younger people. Now we get to the downright ugly. Okay, mixing by race and immigration. You would think this would be so easy. Um, this is where the data get a bit frustrating, and I'm actually going to write to the um, NSFG and talk to them about this, because I think that I, I'm not quite sure who advised them to collect the data this way, but you'll see exactly why it gets frustrating. So for cohabiting relationships, we have partners' race and immigration status when the respondent is a male. When the respondent's female, they didn't ask immigration status. Why? I don't know, right? I mean, that's just, it's crazy, right? So females were only asked the race of their cohabiting partner. <clears throat> For persistent partners, we have race only that's been asked, not immigration status. That doesn't surprise me quite as much, um, but still, I think, I, I think it's the kind of thing that somebody could answer, so it's, a, it's the kind of thing you could certainly ask. Um, and for one-time partners, they don't ask partner race or immigration at all, okay? So this is, what turns out to be funny here is some of the males actually report having sex one time with an ex-cohab, and because it was a cohab, we actually have the information for them. But of course, those are not like most one-time partners, right? So you wouldn't want to use that to impute everybody else. So uh, this is, I guess, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. Um, so what do we do here? We're going to be, and I'll show you how we do this. We use the male reports to impute the partner immigration status for females within race. Here, for persistent partners, we've just decided we're going to use the cohab reports to impute the immigration status. So we're going to make the, the, the persistent partnerships. We're not going to change the race mixing for persistent partnerships. And the race mixing is less tight for persistent or less assorted for persistent partnerships than it is for cohabs. But we will assume that the immigration status uh, pattern is the same. For one-time partners, and this is the ugly, we're going to assume to start random mixing. It's like a ridiculous assumption. We have no information, unfortunately, and we'll probably end up doing a sensitivity analysis to try to address this. Um, so I'm going to give you a sense of what it means to do these imputations. So imagine, this is the nice thing about collecting egocentric sexual network data. So we have, for male respondents, we observe the full mixing matrix of uh, the race and immigration status of what we call ego by the race and immigration status of their partner, their alter. We see the data that we need to uh, fill in all of these cells. And as you would expect, you see most of the observations on the diagonal because there's strong assorted of mixing by race and immigration status. For females, because they did not ask immigration status, uh, we have the sort of the, the sum of the U.S. born and foreign born blacks and the sum of U.S. born and foreign born Hispanics. So we have a five by three matrix uh, for the female egos reporting their male, palter, male, male partner alters. But if you're thinking about it, you realize, well, if I take this matrix, and I transpose it, I just turn it on its side. Now all of a sudden I've got females by males, and there's gonna be some information in that that's gonna help me figure out exactly how I wanna spread these folks out between US born and uh, uh, immigrant blacks. All right, and what we do is, so if you take a look at, in particular, um, this is the sort of two by two that we have for males, which turns into a two by one for females. We basically want to take this 90% and, and divide it up 
so that it looks a little bit not like this pattern here across the row, but in fact, this pattern down the column. And we're going to do that um, by taking some of the, by recognizing that the information here can be used to do that. So, what we do is we take the original male mixing mat mat matrix data here. Now I've got it in terms of numbers because it's a little bit easier to think about that way. We, we transpose it. Um, and what we can see once we transpose it, now we've got the female partner and the male ego report. And we can see that 612 out of the 612 plus 28, here we've got that. Now we've got the, the two by two cells that we need, which is 96% of um, black females' male partners are black. And that's what we're going to use to do this uh, imputation. So that gives you the basic idea about how we do it. We do it within race, uh, so within black and uh, black immigrant and within Hispanic and Hispanic immigrant. And what that gets us is final mixing matrices uh, for males and females, uh, which at the end of the day should be consistent when you take the transpose. They're not perfectly consistent, but they're close. Um, uh, so we end up having the information that we need then uh, for cohabiting partners. For the other partner types, mixing by race, persistent partners, as I said, we're going to use the um, um, we're going to use the cohab uh, distribution to, under, to impute uh, the persistent partner distribution. Um, we're going to be using the, the random mixing assumption for uh, the one-time partners. It probably has little impact just because only 10% of men and 2% of women report any one-time partners over the course of the year. So we'll play with this as a sensitivity parameter, but I don't think it's going to have a large impact. So I'm going to talk a little bit about cross-boundary exposures, and sort of that got us into this whole different way of thinking about um, how we might do calibration and validation. So this will be the end, near the end of the talk. So all transmission simulations, it doesn't matter what kind of methodological framework you're using, are going to be artificially bounded in some way. Nobody models the entire world in their HIV transmission model, right? Um, ours, in fact, is very bounded. It's local heterosexual partnerships only. And all real populations, of course, have porous boundaries. So you want to find some way to represent the influx of uh, infections that may be coming across the boundaries. And there are two population boundaries that we model explicitly, the exposure to the epidemics in foreign countries via the foreign-born and exposure to the local MSM epidemics via the MSMF. Just to give you a sense of what our boundary inputs look like, um, these are taken, again, we don't have good information about this that's local, so we're taking this from the NSFG. Um, we have the percent of the population at the boundary. This, the uh, black immigrant and Hispanic immigrant, um, that we're getting from the American Community Survey. So those are just the straight demographics that are giving us that. The, the fraction of the population that is men who have sex with both men and women, that we're actually getting from the NSFG, so that's about 4%. The boundary exposure probabilities have to do with, in the case of the uh, foreign-born, how often they depart and return. And that is represented in terms of a probability of departure at each time step and a probability of returning at each time step. Um, and for the MSMF, it has to do with how many partners they have across that boundary, which uh, when you analyze the data looks like about two and a half partners per year for the MSMF. That's a, that's a male partner that they'll be having across the boundary. And then there's H HIV acquisition probabilities that are a function of that. Um, those, tend, those tend to be quite small, so that's e to the minus 6, so put six decimal places in front of this, so you can see it's a very small probability. And those are a function of the prevalence of the population across the boundary, whether or not condoms are used, um, the efficacy of condom use, the probability of transmission given contact, and the um, probability of contact per week, because we model, the, the model step is a week. So that's, yes, go ahead. Was the MSMF 4% in a year? Is 4% of the population? No, I think it's a little bit lower in a year. These are, these are people who they may not have had them last year, but they've had them in their lifetime. Right, lifetime. Okay. Yes, right, right. And it's, right. I think it's technically anyone who's had a male 
percent of percent of males who report having a male partner since like 1975. No, oh, no, 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 no. This is no, this is not the Public Health Seattle King County data. This is NSFG oh, data. Okay. Right, 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 so right. It's yeah, so it's lifetime. It might be about two percent in the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's lower, but it's still a it's a surprisingly large number actually. All right. So I'm going to switch now to talk about what it means to do calibration validation. Imagine that I showed you all the other inputs to the model. You wouldn't you'd be yawning even more than you're yawning now. And um, what we'd want to do then is go ahead and throw all of these data put inputs into the model, simulate it, and then see whether or not it reproduces the observed epidemic, right? That's how you that's how you validate a simulation. It doesn't mean that there aren't other inputs that could also produce that, but it basically says, this simulation model will, in fact, reproduce the observed epidemic. So your validation targets are typically HIV incidence and prevalence over time, but limited to a recent time frame. We typically aren't trying to go back to the 1970s, uh, and broken down by demographic group. And typically, I think for almost every model that I've ever seen, the data inputs don't generate right out of the box um, this kind of observed epidemic. So they don't match. So what do you do? Well, what you do then is what's called calibration. You tweak the inputs to obtain target outputs. But I would argue there's a difference between calibration and validation, or at least it would be really nice to preserve that distinction. If you use the same targets, the validation targets, for calibrating, you, you lose the ability to validate your model because you've now tweaked the data input so that they generate this output. That doesn't mean they're right. It just means that you've, you managed to find in the huge space of uh, possible inputs uh, one set of inputs that would actually work. So what would be better is if you had an alternative set of targets for calibration because then you can calibrate the model to those targets, which are also empirical, and then see if it validates by comparing it to the observed HIV incidence and prevalence. It's like an out-of-sample prediction problem, right? So that's the way I'm trying to uh, pursue this. This is an example of a model does, that does not match the validation targets. I think this is about where we are right now, but we are at very early stages at setting these models up. Um, so. You start with uh, you know, the observed prevalence and over, this was what, 20 years? 20 years it goes to zero, basically. Um, so that's kind of what's happening in our model right now, not surprisingly. Um, and it's partly because there's almost no exogenous input here, right? So coming across the boundary, whatever that is, you saw those were extremely small numbers. It's not that the percentage of people on the boundary is small, it's that their probability of, of acquiring HIV is small. So, this is, and this is also an area where we have a lot of uncertainty because we only have Roxanne's data that's only for HIV positives. We don't know what the overall population uh, version looks like. So our original plan was we know there's a lot of uncertainty in this boundary parameter. We were going to use the force of infection across the boundary as our calibration. That's what we're going to tweak, right? And if we didn't have an independent set of targets, we were going to use the HIV incidence and prevalence. Um, and that wasn't ideal because then we can't validate, right? But we just wanted to see, can't, would, we, would we get force of infection across these boundaries that looks anything like realistic um, in order to match uh, our epidemic? But then we ended up having these really interesting discussions with Josh Herbeck and Roxanne on another project that they're doing, which is, um, analyzing the phylogenetics uh, of the infection, the HIV infection here in King County. And essentially what, what Josh showed at me at the summer, I was like, wow. So this is the non-B clade among, we've got roughly 75% coverage for some of the better years. Maybe it goes up to 80% coverage for some of the better years of the Paul sequences. A less. What? A little less. A little less, right. But in any case, there's clear non-B clade, mm -hmm. right? When you look at who's in that, almost all black, right? So that's not crossing over to the white epidemic for us. Almost all heterosexual. So there's a clear signal in the phylogenetics that we can use to calibrate to. We need a model that's gonna produce this sort of distribution of the clade of epidemic and, um, or clade of HIV, and uh, it's gonna need to reproduce it in terms of this demographic composition and this sexual preference composition, right? So if we can use these phylogenetic targets, we can actually preserve the HIV prevalence and incidence time series 
by group for validation. So that's the plan at this point. Um, that's going to take some work as well, and of course it's thrown us off our original calendar for this project because we wanted to take a look at it a little bit. So what we've done in, uh, is we're, we've just submitted an NIHR 21 to, do, to, to really set up the, what those targets need to be, what we can produce in terms of the sequence analysis and what we can produce in terms of the transmission model that will be um, uh, perfect targets for each other. Devin Hamilton is actually the PI for that R21. We're also planning to submit an R01 uh, later this year to do a comparative study of uh, Washington State compared to North Carolina because we think that the heterosexual epidemics are very different there. So if you can use the local data in this generalizable modeling framework and come out with good results, I mean results that look like they make sense and also that help you um, identify prevention opportunities, then this methodology is actually going to work. So. That's where we are. Thanks for your attention, and I promise I'll present results on what we actually found when we find them. Yes? Thanks, Martina. That was a great talk. So I'm glad, I'm very interested in this last topic you presented because it's a problem I've had myself. Mm -hmm. Being like, okay, I use the incidence and prevalence calibration now what do I do exactly um, and I in just looking at other a lot of other papers that say oh we validated they they do the same thing they, yeah they do the same thing so have you seen any other groups successfully do this because everybody talks about validating but they they're this sort of like things they call validation <clears throat> they don't actually right yeah, I think th I think there's been, and I'm a little surprised, but I agree. I think people use the terms validation and calibration interchangeably, and I think that's because people who are trained to do modeling are generally not statisticians, so they don't think about that issue like out of sample prediction the way a statistician would. So I think it's one of those things that's going to make its way into that field, but it hasn't gotten there yet. And so the answer is no. I haven't seen anybody else. Have you? Yeah, I haven't seen anybody else do that yet. Yeah? So in terms of this boundary issue, mm -hmm. do you think the injectors are an important boundary for the heterosexual epidemic? Well, it depends if you classify them with heterosexuals or separately. My sense is that most, if if what these hetero, they're, they're, they're heterosexual with respect to their sexual preference, but their injection is the way that they're transmitting, and if they're sharing needles, that's not heterosexual transmission, even though it's transmission among heterosexuals. Right. It's not the risk group, right? So, so, so the point would be the prevention target is different for, in, for those who are acquiring HIV through needles. The, the issue, I think, is given the small number of heterosexual cases Mm -hmm. Are some of those heterosexual transmissions from people who are acquiring the infection through injection? Drugs? It's possible, um, and certainly you could try to represent that here. I, well, no, no, it's not for sure. It's not for sure, and the reason I say that is because when I was working on uh, data that would have helped to tease some of that apart in uh, New York, it was um, Sam Friedman's data on Bushwick, right? You found very, very little spillover to the non-injecting partners of IDUs. So it is true that IDUs, when they share needles together, even if they're having heterosexual sex, will transmit through the needles. But the ongoing transmission from somebody who acquired it from a needle but passed it on sexually, extremely low. Yeah, I think that of, when you look at the whole population, well, in New York it would be totally different Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that the number of transmission events is very low from that group, but the contribution to the heterosexual epidemic that's non-foreign born mm -hmm. may not be that low, because you're only talking, what, we have about 20 cases per year that are clearly heterosexual uh, in the whole county. Right. But you saw that the concurrency rates are higher in the population that's at risk, right? So there's also that, and there's the contribution of MSMF, right? So I would, I would say my, my, and I would, I mean, this will be a great empirical question to try to run down. Um, um, but my, I, my hunch is 
that the boundaries that are important are more the foreign born and the MSMF. But we'll see, you know, we should, we should place a bet and come back in 10 years and see what we find. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. Martina, um, this has been great. Um, in one of your earliest slides, mm -hmm. every time I oriented myself to it, I couldn't quite digest it all. No. The males and females and uh, race, uh, immigration status. And I just remember that there was something really high for the older Hispanic males. But it might have just been a confidence interval. Was it this? It was probably a confidence interval, yes. You're probably talking about this one. Yeah. That probably means that there's one person and out of, right, so it's, it's, the confidence intervals are huge. So part of what you need to see here, and you see it a little, well, no, I don't, I don't think I have anything. We could be talking about as few, because you're breaking it down by sex. Immigrants are a relatively small fraction anyway, and then breaking it down to the, the 45 to 60 year olds. But That's it, good. It's, it's also high in the non-immigrant ones, but again, with the wide confidence interval. Here, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's micro-numerosity, okay. right? And that's, it just, it's, it's enough to make you weep. You've got 40,000 people in your sample and you're still dealing with a problem of too few observations in a cell, but right? But not in those age groups. That oldest age group comes from the... Uh, uh, no, no, but they've been re-weighted, but they've been re-weighted. Right, well, part of the problem, right, that's true, that's true. That's no, that's F right, that's right. NHSLS is that one, yeah, yeah. That's right. Do you see big differences over 45? In what? Well, I mean, does it seem like there's a big difference? Well, go through the 40s into the 50s in terms of various behaviors to justify switching to data sets as opposed to just using the other data, the data from the NSFG? Because NSFG doesn't have that age no, range. No, okay. No. Just a straight line. Yeah, I, I oh, mean, just, just right, right, the right, right. Would right. Be to use the larger data set. Yeah. To from forty, forward. from forty forward. Well, so yeah, that's that's a really good point, and we may eventually we may end up doing that. I mean, I don't I don't see a lot where we get a little bit of signal no, here. Some of these weird ones that are outliers. Yeah. That we're just looking at, yeah. Yeah. It's not really credible. Right. It's not. No, that's right. And and right. So, and that won't show up in the model if it's not credible. I mean, that's basically what we're looking, part of the reason we do the descriptives here. And one of the things that I haven't said, and it's actually the thing that I'm most, ex well, being a propeller head, um, one of the things I'm most excited about is we're doing all of this in, um, in a reproducible research framework now, right? So all of this is being done in R with uh, something called Markdown. And so the descriptives are now in essentially a book that is a, an HTML book that's online. All of this stuff is available with, and it's got a table of contents and you can quickly see exactly where the descriptives are. You can quickly uh, work through your models and see, oh yeah, we looked at that model and here was the result. And all of that can be rerun in a, a heartbeat basically um, if you change the data for some reason or another or change the model. And that's remarkable. As, as somebody who's been working in this field for longer than I'm gonna talk about, um, I've never seen a better contribution to science in my field, really. It just, it completely changes your ability to do your own work and to work with others and to present the work. It's, it's kind of remarkable, so. I was just reading a model paper in Annals of Internal Medicine, and not only do they not do that, but I couldn't even figure out how they modeled transmission. Like, it wasn't an exactly. appendix, it was nothing. Exactly, exactly. And so what that looks like, you know, so here's, here's, here's our HTML book, you know, so we've got a little overview. Uh, we talk about what this stuff does. Oh, how do, hmm, oh, I know, hang on. This is what happens in class two, it's why, right, so it is that. And this is what I want to do. Right. And we're going to reformat it. Whoa. Okay. 
And now everything is slowing down really low. Well, what I will do is I'll, I'll send you a link to it. But all of this stuff is going to be available online, which is pretty amazing. Um, and the, the tools, they take, you know, it's an investment to learn these tools, but it's totally worth it from my perspective. So good grief. Right, let's just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, Martina, um, if you could have some say on data collection, mm. sir, say on them, mm -hmm. do we have any opportunity to change this? No, you do, actually. I mean, like? yeah, so, I mean, the thing, the big hole locally is we don't have population level data on the sexual behavior. And that's an egocentric sexual network sample. We are collecting that for MSM, so Darcy's project uh, has some of that, and we're going to be collecting a little bit more as part of a Washington State Department of Health project. The thing about MSM is you can do all that online. So it's online data collection. It's very inexpensive. It's about $10 a case, right? And you can run it statewide, and it's, yeah, so that would be really nice. We haven't tried to do that for heterosexuals, and it's a really interesting question whether we could get any kind of a decent sample, right? Do you think, though, given the problem you have with the small numbers yes. and the cell sizes, it's almost going to be worse in the statewide search? Uh, yes, unless you just collect a lot of data. No, right. We would need a massive Right, sample. right, right. So, yes, that's exactly right. So I went in thinking we'd be able to come up with a, but you could also stratify your sample potentially if you were, part, part of the places that we're losing it is with the immigrant population, so maybe you target your sample on that so you, you get better, better coverage. Yeah. But that's, that's, the, that's the main hole right now because everything else we've got. Well, that's a great question, and in order to answer that, I hear exactly what you're saying, and I think, um, there we are, ha, just had to let it think for a while. Um, that's one of the few forms of data that they don't release publicly is any geographic identifiers. Obviously, that's what allows them to release all the other information. Um, so I would actually, it's, it's a great question, and you may be right, all we have to do is get NSFG. If I can get the regional identifier from them in their secure data set and see if there's no real difference. I don't think Seattle heterosexuals are that different. Well, that's what I, you, you wonder maybe. What do the rest of you think? <laughs> Some of you have moved around, I mean. Just for race and other things. Right. Maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, that's my guess. That's my guess. And if so, then that's an incredible resource, the NSFG. Yeah. Yeah. What I would like them to do, they don't collect the egocentric sexual network data for same-sex partnerships. There's no reason for them not to do that. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, that's where, they, that's where their heads were in 2006 when they designed the instrument. Um, with a small change, they could then that, have that nationally for MSM too, which would be great. With your future project with the differences, just based on the syphilis data, Mm -hmm. among um, <clears throat> men are with men and syphilis in, mm -hmm. in, in Seattle. Yeah. 5% have had a female sex partner. Mm -hmm. In Texas and southern states where we worked, it's closer to 12 to 15%. Right. So I realize it's a subset, uh, right. but it would argue right. that these mixing patterns are going to look a lot different. Yeah. But what's so interesting about that is that the Oster data, of course, I only, the only compare, the I don't remember what the numbers are for the southeast versus the west, but the west versus the total country, the phylogenetics suggested more crossover from the MSMF boundary in the west than the nation as a whole. But maybe that's because there's so little yeah. pure heterosexual transmission mm -hmm. that the relative contribution that could is be. Great, but the absolute oh, yeah. is small. Yeah, yeah, that could be. I think as well that HIV, and we've seen this, HIV and, I mean, we see it empirically all the time. HIV, syphilis, and gonorrhea have a different distribution in the population. The sex we're having is the same, right? It's not like, I'm going to have my gonorrhea sex now, you know. 
the syphilis and the HIV mm -hmm. will be closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, these tools eventually will get to the point where they can show you that too. Sorry? It's not divergent. I think that HIV. Uh, no, I bet biome I bet the biomedical the prevention so treatment in particular uh, treatment and prep are going to change the way HIV spreads. It's the same problem. Yeah. I think older older data will show syphilis and HIV are similar, but as we move into biomedical prevention that works, HIV is going to have a very different pattern, I think, than syphilis. Trends. Trends. Trends are divergent. Yes, exactly. Have you tried to model PrEP in heterosexuals, or is that just not such a that's what That's exactly what we're going to try to do here. It doesn't make sense to give PrEP to all heterosexuals, and people are, are kind of stumbling around trying to figure out, well, which group, and that's exactly what we're trying to do here is, I'm thinking these boundaries, right? MSMF and um, people who travel to high, high incidence or high prevalence countries. That's a much, much smaller fraction of the population. And wouldn't it be amazing if you could eradicate with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. All right. Well, thanks for sticking around. An extra 15 minutes, everyone. Yeah.